So I'm Rita McGrath. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Friday Fireside Chat, where my guest this week is Noah Wilson-Rich, a citizen scientist, beekeeper, and um, a C well, co I guess co-founder and uh, chief scientific officer of Best Bees. So I'm looking forward to hearing all about that. Uh, while you're all getting settled, let me just remind you that this is being recorded. So do not say anything that you do not want the Wall Street Journal, your mother, or your annoying Aunt Sally to find out about. Um, <laughs> uh, Missy will be putting uh, information about follow-ups and what you can do to uh, build on this conversation in the chat. Uh, we don't generally do raise hands here, but we do do chat. So if you have uh, comments or information, uh, just pop them in the chat. And the reason is just, I don't know who's, you know, <laughs> who's, who's attending. So uh, we try to be a little bit careful with our guests. So welcome, Noah. So um, let, let's just start off with your journey, uh, because it's, I think it's a fascinating story. You didn't like insects growing up much. Oh, no, Rita, it's so funny. I remember growing up as a kid, my whole family was scared of spiders. I think everybody can relate to this. When you see a creepy crawly, you're usually too busy running from it to identify, is that really a bee? We call everything a bee, but we're so busy running. Um, but it wasn't until school where I learned that some were beneficial. You know, pollinators give us food and butterflies play an important role. And they're very interesting. Bees and other wonderful creatures out there, they give us food. And so we've got to not run or kill everything with a shoe or with chemicals. There's an important role and humans are just one part of the larger world. So how did you go from there to be getting, you got a PhD, right, in biology? And I mean, that must have been one, <laughs> one heck of a course. <laughs> <laughs> for, um, for me, I was pre-med in college because my father told me to. He said, go to med school, son, then we'll talk. And I thought, geez, dad, if you go to med school, then we won't have to talk. I'll have it figured out by then. Um, but I was pre-med. And in doing so, I had some wonderful internship opportunities. I worked at Children's Hospital in Boston and with Harvard Medical School doing clinical research. I loved it there. But the kids were there for a reason. They were sick. And I loved getting to know them but it was tough work. And I would find myself staring at the window and wondering, how do I get some fresh air? So I had a really inspiring teacher named Becky Rosengauss. And she said, you know, why don't you take your interest in health and in how groups stay healthy together, but consider not humans, consider going outside and working with a different study system for research. Mm -hmm. And so she was working with termites at the time. And I joined her lab thinking, oh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> but what we did was we learned science. She taught me how to do research and we got some publications together and she opened up my world to this fascinating ability to study animals and to learn more about our human selves. So for graduate school, I started at Tufts. I've got a PhD in biology and I worked with honeybees to understand how they as social creatures stay healthy over a hundred million years of evolutionary time, but without doctors, without hospitals, no nurses or pharmacies. And I wanted to know how we humans could learn from that to be our healthiest society. That was in 2005. And in 2006, when I was finishing up my first year in graduate school, bees started disappearing. Maybe you heard about this, Rita, with colony collapse disorder, and the vanishing bees. Mm. I mean, it was making the New York Times. At the time, CSI was really picking up as a TV show and people loved a good missing body story. But as this related to our food system and our availability of fruits and vegetables and the affordability of healthy food, people started coming to me and saying, what's going on with our bees? Do we need them as pollinators? The farm to table movement was just taking off. And so it made me realize that there was so much more to this research than just the scientific aspect. It really touched people's hearts. Take us back to 2005, 2006, colony collapse syndrome, farm to table people. It seemed like that moment because we've been talking about bees for a long time, but that seems to have been a crystallizing moment. It's really, it's, it's exactly right. You know, any of us who've done research, when we're thinking about what we do from one particular angle, like the scientific angle, we've got to have a hook so that people understand why we're doing this. You know, Whoopi Goldberg is one of our wonderful clients in New Jersey, in the oranges. And when we talked about bees and why bees and why should she get bees, we started talking about food and hunger around the world. And we were talking about all the headlines, you know, her work on The View, she has to deal with translating headlines to the general people, the general population every day. And when there's so much bad news out there and we think, Ugh, I'm just going to give up, I can't do anything. And when you're considering maybe I should be a senator to really maximize my potential, 
what we everyday people can do, it's a little bit more limited. And so when you can do something like get a garden, get a beehive and connect those things with research, those are ways that everyday people can start to make an impact and make the world a better place. You know, bees are the tie that binds. Mm -hmm. So everybody who gets a pollinator habitat can start to improve our food system and actually make an impact. So was, it, I, was that where the concept, if you're into food, you should be into bees came from? Absolutely, you know, bees equal food. You know, that's the shortest sentence, the best way I can put it. When I finished up my PhD at Tufts, it was 2009. The economy was terrible and there weren't many job opportunities out there for PhDs with the focus in honeybee immunology in a good economy. So I thought, what have I done? I should have gone to business school. I should have done something else. Um, but instead I started a Facebook page and I started a company we called it Best Bees. You know, our bees are the best. I said, I'm selling beehives. I'll volunteer my time to manage them in exchange for research funding. At the time, we were looking at vaccinations for bees, ways to keep them healthy, mm -hmm. but we had nothing to lose. And so I took a business approach. When I give talks to kids in schools, I teach them about entrepreneurship and consulting with a social media page. Whatever you know something about, maybe you got picked on as a kid, maybe these days it's Pokemon or some other kind of nerdy thing. When people ask them a question, you charge a dollar for the answer and now you're in business. So for us, what seemed silly in 2010, 11 years later, we've created an industry, which we call beekeeping services. We're a multi-million dollar company, we've got over 70 employees nationwide in 15 cities. And we primarily work with home gardens and business rooftops. And what we call this movement of going gray to green, you know, COVID especially is shifting the corporate landscape so that everybody's involved with green, sustainable ESG reporting goals. And that's exactly what we do at Best Bees as a sort of biodiversity reporting company. So when you think about your empty rooftops and now you start to move that towards a pollinator habitat, this is how we can make an impact and really make the world a better place. That's amazing. And you just made the ink list, is that right? That's right. Yeah, we made the Inc. 5000 list on our 10th anniversary last year, which was really exciting. Um, we bootstrapped. You know, this is one of those examples where a company started in my apartment living room. Um, I was bartending at it at the time at a business school bar. <laughs> and there was a competition with MIT for a pitch contest. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard about it through the business school. And so I said, uh, sure, I'll enter. And I won it. And the next day, all the kids at the business school said, the bartender got it? <laughs> And so there are wonderful lessons in leadership from all around, whether it's the bar or within the beehive, because anybody can make an impact. And that's a big message that I like to share. I, I think that's so hopeful right now, because I do think a lot of our problems are so big. People kind of, I can't do anything about the climate. I can't do anything about political division. I can't do anything about, you know, the list is very long, but I could maybe get a beehive. Now, yeah, so let's talk about the, the negatives, right? Because a lot of people, when they hear about bees, they think stinging bad, you know, uh, my mother was allergic to bee stings. So she had to take a, you know, a, an injector with her everywhere she went. Um, is that just overblown? <laughs> no, you know, and it's kind of the question is our feelings overblown in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think anybody who does business at all, you know, international business, it's always at the local level. You really have to connect with people and listen. So whatever stories and experiences people have about bees or any other product, really, we've got to hear them out because that allows for a human connection. And that's really what we're all about at the end of the day. So if somebody has uh, trepidations about bees, we like to tell them these are the nice ones. And so working with bad bees or aggressive things is a bad business model. Um, so we specialize in beehives on skyscraper rooftops in part because as I shared in my first TEDx talk, Bees are dying, but they're doing better in cities and the higher up we go. So those empty rooftops are actually hidden assets for real estate companies where they can really help improve the environment for pollinator habitat, for veggie gardens, for all of the tenants. You know, right now in the United States, it's a scandalous idea to grow carrots on an apartment building rooftop. To feed your family with fruits and vegetables and honey from the rooftop, we think well, we could never do that. But this should be people's biggest worry. And that's why I like to put myself as a businessman at the forefront of what we see as inevitable change. And then interacting with, how do you feel about that? Would you eat some carrots from your roof or would you prefer it as an empty, barren landscape? That's really interesting. And, and one of the things you talk about in, in your TED Talk was the, some of the misconceptions about why bees 
uh, well, why they're dying and what makes them healthy and that we really don't understand that very well. Maybe, maybe you could elaborate on, it, on that. Absolutely. You know, so bees are vegan. And so many people, when we're running away from insects and nature, as I did as a kid, very much my whole family did, we think about everything as scary, you know, like the elephant and the mouse kind of syndrome. But in reality, think about Jurassic Park, where the kids are petting the vegetarian dinosaurs and running from the meat eaters. If we slow down for a moment and realize, you know, I don't have to run from everything in nature. I don't have to pave over everything. It's okay to have a landscape that's biodiverse. This was my last webinar too. It's something that's so worthwhile pausing and noticing nature, especially in the pandemic when we're looking at our windows. Notice those flower buds. As you shared, Rita, notice that patch of ice, the last little grasp of, of winter on your property, and then see what comes up in its place. And notice what this flower feeds butterflies and bees. And if we can promote these things, like a no mow policy, instead of mowing your lawn, let a meadow grow. God forbid, I know it's scandalous, but that's habitat that really helps the environment. The more biodiversity is better. So it's important to acknowledge when people have a fear of bees, you know, hear them out, but understand that beekeepers don't want to get stung either. And especially the best bees, you know, we have a perfect safety record over 11 years across the country. So it's really important to that people know that this is safe. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, people forget, like, unlike wasps or, or other less benign creatures, you know, stinging something is not something a bee really wants to do. Not at all. No. So bees are different than hornets, wasps, yellow jackets. Those are the meat eaters. So they have huh. to sting to eat. Um, it's kind of like any other predator. Bees being vegan, they do not. So the males don't have stingers. The males, this is a very fun thing to get into, but what's the role of males in successful non-human societies? We see over evolutionary time that males do not have any sort of leadership power. We don't have any society that has a king alone, other than the United States of America with only male presidents. There are lessons there to learn from the natural world where there's a queen bee. We see female domination across human societies. Rarely we might see a king and a queen, like I mentioned working with termites, that's one example. So female leadership is really, really important across the natural world. And there's so much more we can learn there. If only we kind of paused to understand, we don't have to run from these things. In fact, if we embrace them, we can really make an impact on the world. Mm -hmm. So you are exploring what allows bees to be successful. And one of the theories was, well, too many insecticides. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I recall, you did a series of studies looking at insecticide density versus bee survival, and that didn't pan out so well. And then, um, or didn't, that didn't appear, that hypothesis did not appear to be supported, let's put it that way. Um, but so what were the things that, that allow bees to be successful? You mentioned biodiversity. Right, right. So really, when we think about what's threatening our food system, what's threatening biodiversity, really for any corporate leader who's thinking about ESG, you know, what really makes an impact to go beyond just the talk, but to the action. When we think about pollinators, we think about the top three things that are killing them off. And that includes pesticides, diseases, and habitat loss. So there are not enough flowers to keep them healthy, not enough nutrition. So when we wanna make an impact on biodiversity, it's a really important and really um, efficient way to help the planet and help hit those ESG reporting targets. When you think about planting more flowers, I mean, it's so easy, but anybody can do this, whether you live in an apartment in New York City and you don't have land and you want to do some guerrilla gardening, you plant some seeds, you do this with some kids, take a walk and just throw some native seeds on any property. You know, you can always dig them out if somebody has a problem with it. Or if you have a, an asset, whether it's a rooftop, a deck or a garden, plant diverse things. That's making a huge impact. And that's something that's very low cost. Mm -hmm. um, with our research, beehives, each beehive that Best Bees puts out there, it's a data factory. It's a bio indicator of ecosystem health. Mm -hmm. It gives us information that we then include in our corporate reports for amazing things that are actually helping to improve bee health, mm -hmm. such as plant diversity. One thing we invented was called honey DNA. It's using genomic technology. Yeah. Um, have you done uh, Ancestry DNA or 23andMe before? I haven't personally, but I know, you know, I've of course heard about it. Yeah, I mean, so, so genomics, it's one of these cutting edge technologies, you know, I'm with MIT. So we're thinking about blockchain and artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and all of it with bees. 
but with genomics, this is the first time we've done this with plants and with the environment and measuring the impacts of climate change to understand how our landscapes change. We look at samples of honey and we identify all the plant DNA in them. And we include those reports to show here are all the plants, 411 different plant species from my home beehive in Boston, for example, that were increasing the abundance of. So by having a little box of pollinators connected to data, for example, NASA is our research partner now. So each of those beehives is a living data factory for NASA's understanding of climate change. We can then give more reports and show here are all the plants that your little box of pollinators on the empty rooftop, is what you're helping to uh, encourage and, and the abundance of. It also is what we're tasting in honey. So for a lot of communities and companies that share the honey with employees or tenants, you now understand what we're tasting because even though this year in 2021, we might think, oh, honey is good. We still don't know what to call it. We don't know the terroir of it. We don't really have honey sommeliers. <laughs> I love that. A new career. <laughs> we call that innovation with food science and engaging people around sustainability to mm -hmm. plant flowers, everyone. Huh. So one of our viewers wants to know how bees communicate with each other. This is great. Well, I, you know, I'd be happy to dance <laughs> to show you <laughs> Nobel Prize winning research. It's called the Waggle Dance. And um, Carl von Frisch, who won the prize with uh, Martin Lindauer in the 1970s, to understand how this complex society of bees communicates. And this is a wonderful example, actually, Rita, when we're thinking about leadership lessons from the hive. If you want to draw some insight and inspiration for any team or group or large company, when they have, as we do at Harvard Business School, through window where the teams and the students can look at a beehive and they're thinking about their own group work. And perhaps some individuals might feel like they're a little quiet in the team, or maybe this group is so big or I'm intimidated or for anybody who identifies with imposter syndrome thinking, oh, I shouldn't share my thought. What's really important that we can draw as a lesson from the beehive here through this waggle dance communication system that they do is that group change happens from one individual amongst tens of thousands, in part because what she finds, remember she, males don't do anything, what that one bee finds is when she's going out to flowers and coming back, she might come upon a better house. Maybe it's a nice hole in a tree that she wants the entire beehive to move to. And she thinks, this is a nice house that nobody's living in. So I'm going to go back and tell all of my beehive, we should move there. But how does one bee do that? How does she change the entire behavior of the group? She does it through dancing. She comes back to the hive and she does this with enthusiasm. So for any individual in a company, whatever you discover Share it with enthusiasm. Ask your teammates to go validate it. Here's what I see. Here's what I think. Check it out. This is really important, guys. And for a beehive, at least, through dancing, that information includes the direction of that new home, how far that new home is from the beehive, and the quality of the home through the wiggling. It's kind of a shake your butt in a figure eight motion. <laughs> I love doing this with kids because- Oh, sure something to say, you know, if they don't raise their hand, you know, wiggle your butt and the teacher or parents will notice like, do you have something to say? <laughs> so when the bees do this and they dance, they recruit other bees. And once they validate that thought or that new nesting site, they will start to dance too. And so eventually a consensus is reached and that leads to an entire group's dynamic for behavioral change. So do they go back and forth and check it out or do they all go or is this like a sequence? So yeah, it's an entire sequence. It's really well established. And through evolutionary time over 100 million years, this is what natural selection has favored this type of system. So for corporations, for leaders, for your entire audience here, Rita, that I'm so excited to connect with, the lessons we can learn from the natural world abound. Humans have been around for tens of thousands of years, and we're trying to do our best to figure it out. How do you build a great corporation? How do you build a great nation? What can we do here? We learn from the Romans, we learn from the Greeks, but have we learned from bees, you know, and the termites and the wasps, these societies that are so complex and have so many similarities, such as their communication systems, such as their leadership structure. And that's what's so inspirational about having a beehive on campus. You look at that and you think, huh, what am I missing here? Is this problem unique or has it already been solved? 
That's fascinating. Well, one of the things we're, you know, really talking a lot about these days with leadership is that, first of all, you need ways to get information directly from what I, what I call the edges. And it sounds like the bees actually empower, like, like people or not people, but <laughs> members at the edges uh, to go, go out and find stuff and then come back and report on what they found in a very open way. And I think a lot of leaders even today struggle with this. They, you know, they, they've been brainwashed into thinking they have to have all the answers and I have to be right. And whatever I predict has to come true. And, and it just, it's so dysfunctional in a highly uncertain world. And how many leaders in that situation feel like this problem is unique to them? Mm-hmm. You know, and for somebody in your position, you know, as a professor, as somebody so experienced, when you hear these things, I'm sure that they sound familiar. You think, oh, well, here's what I've experienced before. Here's what I've seen. Mm-hmm. And so for bees, one lesson we can learn is it only takes about 5% of the whole group to make the decision. And in fact, the leader, the queen bee herself, she's busy. I mean, she's laying eggs. You know, she's making sure that others know she's there because without a leader, so to speak, without the queen, the whole society does fall apart. So the beehive knows the leader's there through her smell, just like in a corporation, you know, tens of thousands of workers, you know, I've been working with JP Morgan Chase recently. So they've got many campuses with over 10,000 employees. They don't all have access to the leaders or the CEOs, but they need to know they're there. And so for at least a beehive, it's about 5% of the individuals to reach a consensus, a quorum in order to move the whole nest. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are leading it are those 5% that are on the outside Mm -hmm. and they make sure everybody else stays in. For humans, it's about 25%. What we're seeing is the threshold. And Shankar Vedantam just uh, did a wonderful podcast um, talking about the snowball effect and Mm -hmm. what amount of a human group is needed in order to drive change. Mm -hmm. And that amount is 25%. So bees only need 5%. Bees only need 5%. They're more evolved, one could say, (laughs) than humans. But the lesson here, Rita, that is so important is that anytime we individuals or we leaders are faced with a problem that seems so much bigger than us, how am I possibly going to onboard everybody? The lesson here is don't. Don't try. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. You only need a small threshold to accept this idea and they validated themselves and you have to be enthusiastic about it. And that's what drives change. Mm-hmm. So say more about this self-validation. Cause I think that's fascinating. What I see, I mean, what I see in human societies a lot is this almost paralyzing lack of trust, right? So um, in fact, last week I was talking to Bjarta Bognes about budgeting, you know, and he made the point that one of the things we do with budgeting is we we try to exert control because once upon a time, somebody in the company charged a toy for his kid to the corporate account. And we're going to put in place rules that make sure that never happens again. And it doesn't sound to me like bees have like an employee handbook <laughs> or, you know, thou shalt nots and you've got to, you know, submit your expense reports six times over. It doesn't sound to me like that's how they control things. <laughs> You're dancing, you know, they have a more pleasant way to do it. But again, just remembering that we humans, we're animals, we're part of a much larger world that's been around much longer than we have. And our problems are really not that unique, even though our scenarios are. So we might be in a budgeting meeting, but what you're describing here, where there was an accident before, and now that group, that company has corrected by putting a plan in place to make sure that doesn't happen again. From an evolutionary perspective, that's called natural selection. It's come up with a solution so that over time, things change and kind of learn from the mistakes, those get weeded out. And what I'll share with you here, Rita, is that with bees, it is believed that it is a perfect decision-making system, that errors do not happen when selecting a new site to live in because this process of one worker bee enthusiastically sharing her findings and then getting validated by the other bees allows her to then fall back. She's done her part. She stops dancing. Oh, so she, she starts the conversation as it were. She starts okay. the conversation. And then other bees take her information and they validate or they don't, they go say, uh, you know, I don't think what you shared is important. So they might come back and say, okay, I'm gonna repeat your dance, but not enthusiastically. And it really comes down to that individual enthusiasm of communication to be believable. And that that, uh, process has really allowed for honesty and success over evolutionary time with group change and group decision-making. So I think that that's where we're going too. And just having trust in the system, Mm -hmm. trust 
group is the answer rather than trust in the individual. Mm-hmm. Let the individual share their message and then have other members of the group validate it. Over evolutionary time, it works every time. Wow. You know, it reminds me a lot of some of the more successful leaders that we've seen in business recently. So Alan Mulally, right, who turned around Ford, has this technique he calls one team. You know, trust the team, trust the process. He, he comes up and he, he reinforces that all the time. And it sounds to me like that's rediscovering what bees know. Yeah, I mean, Alan maybe could be the ultimate queen bee, right? <laughs> you know? I bet he'd love to be described that way. <laughs> I mean, you know, if there were a king bee, sure. But again, we're being so human centered when we think about it that way. I mean, it's nothing but complimentary, of course. And when we think about wonderful leaders like Sally Helgeson, I, I, you know, you had her a couple of weeks ago as well. You know, just the world's leading expert at female leadership for us to come together and to understand the group power, the importance of selecting good individuals to build your group. You know, another completely different example and a a hypothesis I love to think about a lot is called the helpers at the nest hypothesis. As an explanation for the origin of homosexuality, for the origin of non-reproductive individuals, for the origin of people on your team who aren't going to be the ones who come up with all the ideas, but they're there to support. Groups that have more of these support people rather than superstars tend to be more successful than groups that do not. Groups that have more helpers really help support those queen bees. So with Alan Mulally, for example, he had a wonderful team and that was really what it was all about rather than many queen bees. There can only be one queen, Mm -hmm. but it's about the group. That's fascinating. Well, you know, Aubert Jolie, who I know you also know, um, former CEO of Best Buy, he has a new book coming out, which hopefully I'm going to get him on here to talk about. Uh, it's called The Heart of Business. And, you know, he talks about his journey going from someone who was very analytical and, you know, hard numbers crunching and driving, driving, driving to much more of this kind of leadership, really, you know, letting people discover their own best talents and grow into those. It's exactly it. And, you know, the health and wellness component cannot be forgotten about because, you know, Marshall Goldsmith at the end of the day recently did an exercise with, with our hundred coaches group who was saying at the end of a career, what, what's left, what are we doing? We are such social creatures that we don't often give credit to our nature. And so when we're working in a group in a corporate setting, or we're working with family or friends or anybody, sometimes we can feel misunderstood. We feel like we have a direction, an idea, and we just want people to get on board. And if you can't, then get out. I have the wrong team. And at the end of that career, it could feel disappointing and thinking, what have I really done if not connected with people? Because that is our human nature. We are on a pathway towards getting ever more social. And so the more we can see the lessons that have already been learned on our behalf, whether companies, other groups, other species, the Mm -hmm. easier it will be on us and the better we'll be doing. Well, it's interesting when you mention social, because um, I know one of our guests here is Ann Kurtzenberger, with whom I've worked for years. And and she said something I thought was just hilarious. Once she looked at me, she said, you know, there's all this talk about social media. It's not social, it's typing. (laughs) And I thought that was brilliant. It is amazing. I mean, the evolution of social systems, the evolution of communication, it's so different. It's so context dependent, right? So social media, sure, maybe it works in some ways. It's not going to work in every way. And in many opportunities, it hurts. Part of our research with bees, you know, we sent bees into outer space last year, (laughs) which is crazy. It's one of the benefits of being in academia. I mean, Rita, I'm sure that some of your Columbia business students come to you with crazy ideas, maybe not sending things to us. But it's part of what I feel like keeps me alive. Mm -hmm. What we learned from that was the social structure of bees remained intact in that chaotic environment. It came back down to the group level. Mm -hmm. We sent bees up there and they came back down. They all survived. We were thinking how to breed a stronger bee, future farming out in space. If we're going to live in space or on the moon, how do we have food? Are we hand pollinating? A lot of different aspects there. Bees in Mars. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, if we're going somewhere, we're going to need food and we'll need people to do smarter things rather than hand pollinate as we're already doing in some places on earth because bees are dying off. Wow. But the lessons in leadership here, lessons in communication, is social media the right channel for something? Is Slack good? Is in person the best way? The lesson here from our experiments with bees, in part with DARPA, you know, a U.S. funding agency and understanding communication systems with groups is if we disrupt one modality, other ones can be temporary solutions. 
Sometimes they are not good long-term solutions. So with social media, it's so important to listen to your colleague here to think about the harmful ways, the benefits of those to society um, and to know that there's no one solution that's going to be great. And I'll just say, if you're in doubt, dance it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. But I think the part of the problem with social media is that it sends these signals, which a lot of times get um, distorted. Right. I mean, you know, with your bees, they're all together. They're, there's smell, there's sound, there's movement, there's all these cues. Right. And with I think with social media, what often happens is we get miscued, you know, or we or we put way there's way too much, I think, on one or two cues and not enough of the richness of um, context. That's right. And we're thinking about the evolution of communication systems, uh -huh. not to go too deep in evolutionary biology here, but this research, again, can be done with social insects. Mm -hmm. We think about what is sustainable over time and what dies off. Mm -hmm. Think about relationships, so mutualism. When we communicate something, if I, like right here, this conversation, I think, is very mutualistic where we're learning from one another. <laughs> It could be altruistic. So one of us is sharing something at the detriment of the other. You know, usually that's accompanied by reciprocal altruism. So if I share something with you, maybe that benefits you, but hurts me with my energy. But in return, we'll flip the script later. And so there's a benefit. When we see spiteful systems where it's a net negative, those really do not persist over evolutionary time and will get weeded out. So when we're thinking about distrust in a system, we know that's not gonna last, it does die off. Selection, we would say, does not favor those systems over ones that are benefiting the group. If we're thinking about bots on social media you know, and lies and deceit, that often just burns out. It doesn't persist over evolutionary time. It certainly happens. It's very real. It's very scary right now in a time of distrust, conspiracy theories but these don't persist over time. And that's why we can take so much inspiration from the natural world to see, well, what does persist? Mm -hmm. How did those systems prevent those lies? And I'll tell you from this waggle dance from the beehives, the way that those systems detect lies is through enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You can tell if you're not too excited about what you're sharing, I don't know if I'm gonna trust you and I don't know if I'm gonna share that. And even if you do share that, it, the enthusiasm weakens over time versus what you know is true. And so that's how it prevents that group from making the decision. Oh, that is fascinating. There's a wonderful book I read years and years ago. Um, it was called Mutual Aid. Mm -hmm. And it talked about exactly this principle, which was that ecologies in which the inhabitants don't in some way contribute to one another eventually become transformed into some other kind of ecology. Um, and I think that makes a similar point to, to what you were talking about. Absolutely. You know, I consider myself a behavioral ecologist, right? So how does our behavior change in the context of our environment? And I just want to preface all the things that I do with bees and other social animals. You know, I, I don't mean to anthropomorphize bees at all by saying they feel certain things or they act in human ways. And, and I think that could become misconstrued. So I just want to add this, you know, the inferences and the inspiration that we can take from the natural world, those are discussion points. It's a very different approach from a lot of the common talking points that we do as leaders. And so I want the value there to be in the questions. Mm -hmm and the ability to test hypotheses for leadership and group communication mm -hmm. and what persists over time. Um, and so I think that environment is very important. And that's why we always wanna do this in places where bees are thriving, bringing it back down to kind of how we started. Because bees do better on rooftops and in cities, that's why we wanna have those beehives that we use for research in areas where they're thriving so we can understand that their waggle dance system is really at the best capacity as possible. Uh -huh. So um, for our, our listeners, um, how do we become beekeepers? How do we get our own beehive? I love this. See, you know, we just took this question from, I'm terrified of the bees. I don't want a bee sting. Or two, wait a minute, how does this work? Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's really part of my life's work. And again, this gray to green movement. Any of you who are listening, I'm sure you can think about a part of your property or someplace you know that you just don't know what to do with. So consider pollinator habitat. It comes in two flavors. One is nesting, like a beehive or a bee hotel, and the other is foraging, so flowers. Think about how you can activate an underutilized area and turn it into an asset. We call this concept even biophilia. We're seeing many corporations 
leveraging their properties, whether it's a rooftop, a deck, or a ground, with a nature space to have meetings at. For example, EMD Serono in Massachusetts is a wonderful example. They're owned by Merck out of Germany. We see these trends so commonly in Europe where there are wonderful places to meet that bring in wellness through biophilia, as we call it, benefiting ourselves and our relationships through the natural world. So when we wanna bring in beehives, there are options. You can either become a beekeeper yourself, which is less common, but join a beekeeping association. So New Jersey has a wonderful group I've spoken at, um, New Jersey Beekeepers Association. You usually just Google your local county or state beekeepers association for local resources. They will provide you usually with some education and mentorship and sourcing. The second of three options is to find a local beekeeper to put his or her or their beehives on your property. Usually it's not your bees then, you don't keep the honey, but you get the joys of bees, uh, which is a thing. You can take so much joy from watching a beehive, as we mentioned, biophilia, but it's very calming. In 1919, the US government promoted beekeeping as a way for veterans returning from World War I to get back into the workforce. Um, and even for, uh, for my fellowship with the Global Good Fund, um, we had a track for creating jobs and opportunities for people over the age of 50 to return to the workforce with their expertise and ability to provide a calming nature with beekeeping and gardening. The third way and final way to get bees on your property is the beekeeping service. So that's what we do with the Best Bees Company. So this is where a service will be like a garden service or a pool service. You hire Best Bees to install and fully manage beehives at your empty rooftop to leverage that as an asset. Um, they also provide data reporting to support a lot of ESG goals to make it a bit easier, including the full biodiversity list using our plant genomics technology and honey DNA. Um, some wonderful opportunities to explore. And, um, and there's a lot more that we could always be doing, even mm -hmm. if a little bit helpless at times. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's very inspiring. One of the, I want to come back to the DNA thing for just a minute, because one of the things I thought was, was really fascinating about your, your previous TED talk is this idea that for certain regions at certain times of the year, you can actually look at the floral composition of the honey and what it does. And I mean, you, you talk about a terroir for, you know, for, for honey, um, but I could see that totally feeding into the whole farm to table, authentic, as few ingredients as possible, the whole subtlety of all that movement. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Rita, even rooftop to table, have you heard that term before? No, <laughs> that's a new one. It's, it brings me images of people like leaping off and landing on the no, table yeah. going, ta-da. <laughs> no, yeah. Have fun with all the ideas and then just remember it's safe. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Safety above all else, health and wellness above all else is my saying, my team knows I say that all the time. It's so important because as the world evolves, inevitably we change and it's not necessarily we go for the better, but things change. And so we can think about cities and the future of cities as not having these empty rooftops. We think about goals like the Paris Climate Accord that sets that we need to stop our temperature from increasing by one and a half degrees. And we're seeing data that say, if we have green rooftops across a city, that we can already bypass that temperature goal from the Paris Climate Accords through green roofs alone. And we see Whole Foods as one of our national accounts that has rooftop farms. So when you go to markets, you can buy right from the inner city farm on the rooftop. And in doing so with rooftop honey, you're tasting your landscape. This is what your neighborhood tastes like. So you're building community around food that's also helped with science. So by identifying the plant DNA in honey, we call this honey DNA, and you can check out my third TEDx talk that's on TED.com where we talk a little bit more about this or National Geographic, we published this in, what types of honeys are produced from cities across the US. This is a way to add value to the honey tasting experience, of course, but also for corporations that are doing this as a sustainability program this honey is a way to build community around sustainability with a custom logo, custom label with your brand, maybe even a QR code on the top so that employees can go to your webpage that says what your values are as a company and how what you're tasting is a measure of biodiversity. It's a way to engage people so much more than just saying solar panels and windmills and Paris Climate Accords. Yes, those are so important. Mm -hmm. And also, how do we get people engaged? Right. So through honey, by shifting our perspective ever so slightly, it really can change the world. 
And again, from the bottom up, it should show people in a leadership and a worker perspective that it's not all the queen bees, not everybody has to be an Alan Mulally to make a difference and to drive change. Any worker bee can do so as well. That's inspiring. That's really inspiring. So are we seeing any positive trends towards the, the I mean, do we understand, first of all, why we had this, this collapse syndrome? You know, it was really mysterious why bees started disappearing. And one of my um, most favorite bee researchers in the world, her name is May Greenbaum. <laughs> I love the idea that you have a favorite bee researcher. <laughs> Say again who it was, who it is. Uh, May Berenbaum. And Rita, I love that I can nerd out with you. We can talk business. <laughs> science, we're talking bugs. <laughs> so Mia Berenbaum, she is a wonderful distinguished faculty member at the University of Illinois. And she wrote a piece in the New York Times in 2007 that not only announced to the world that bees were disappearing, but as a scientist, she kind of took that hat off for a moment and said, let's, let's talk real to real people here. This is a big deal. And that's why she came to the Times and she announced this to everybody and said, you need to care. If you eat food, if you care about your kids and grandkids eating fruits and vegetables, this is a really big deal. So that showed me how to be a scientist that communicates when colony collapse disorder ended in 2011, we started to stop seeing the bees disappearing and we started to see them just as dead bodies. And what this meant was scientists were very confused. We didn't want to tell everybody, oh, the bees are fine, just because they weren't disappearing anymore. We just started to see them as dead. And that meant the definition of colony collapse disorder was a little bit different. In 2014, I announced this in the New York Times as a bookended piece from what May Berenbaum wrote in 2007 mm -hmm. announcing this, 2014, I took to the Times and I said, you know, scientists haven't seen this in a few years, but we still need to care because bees are still dying just in a different way. So the trends that we found ever since, and I've been sharing these with Ted, rooftops are really important. Corporations that have campuses, like as I mentioned, JP Morgan Chase, they have a lot of acreage. Same thing with Fidelity, where they have farms. We're seeing this very common Toyota, um, transportation companies have land. It is their responsibility and it is those employees in those leadership roles who can make a change, it's their responsibility and their duty to connect those lands with data somehow. This is the inevitable natural world and where I love to be as an executive at the forefront of where we know the world will go and how can we leverage technology, whether it's through genomics like honey DNA or connecting land to data sets like through the internet of things, through data sensors that's where we can drive impact. And so by putting these research beehives all around, we've got about a thousand now across campuses in 15 greater metro areas, it's a network. And that network, not to go too deep with the tech, but that can lead to what we call a blockchain. If each beehive is a computer and they have their own network and they start recording the health of bees and sharing that ESG reporting data, we start to see in a very truthful, honest way that helps us get around the mistrust of government data and the mistrust of other data records. That's the benefit of blockchain. All of these computers become their own brain network. And so for what I was working on with TED 2020, which um, you know, was changed this year, was a way to share with people how blockchain is a solution for really what will save the bees by having these records that are stored in each beehive over time in a very trustworthy, non-hackable way, we're starting to engage with some cutting edge technologies, but for corporations to show their employees how we're integrating these technologies in a very light way, you know, small investment for a big impact. It's how we get started. And all of this really comes down to a little box of beehives. Mm, that's amazing. That is amazing. So the, um... I think it might be valuable just to spend a minute on the concept behind blockchain. It's this idea that you have these self-replicating ledgers. Absolutely. So um, we think about our project in, under a code name of Smart Hive. Smart Hive. Okay. Smart Hive. You can even think about you know smart homes. Um, the Internet of Things is a concept under which I met Martha Stewart in the halls of MIT. I was so intimidated, but I knew that Martha was a beekeeper. And I said, you know, it's now or never for any of us who are so intimidated, you know, as I feel with you, Rita, and I'm so much more comfortable now being here, you know, we've got to say hello. And so I said to Martha, what are you doing here? <laughs> And she was working on the internet of things with kitchens. You know, for example, why don't we get a text message from our turkey on Thanksgiving when it's done in the oven? 
you know, I mean, it's just it doesn't exist yet. Why don't we have a text message from our refrigerator when our milk is spoiled? You know, these are the inevitable future parts of where technology will make our, our lives better. When we extend that to include other aspects like machine learning, maybe that will look in our kitchen and it'll get to beehives in our kitchen. Our fridge will learn, oh, you just added some milk, I see. Well, that's going to go bad in 10 days. And so I'm going to tell you in eight days to buy some. It starts to understand how we work. Mm -hmm. When we incorporate um, uh, augmented reality, so that's when we've had an image through our smartphone to show something pop up. For example, on our beehives, we're working on having that pop up with a graph, how much honey is in your beehive. So when you look at it through there, you can get data, you start to get information. There can be an app for your turkey in the oven that says, oh, this is the temperature of your turkey. It just pops it up, something like that, to make it easier and more interactive. Hmm. So the way that we're leveraging these technologies and doing so with our business partners who really want to add some bulk to these ESG reports and show their investors and stakeholders that they're including this technology. Mm -hmm. I think it's a big challenge for leaders these days to know how do you stay up on all these things? And this is where I invest bees really love to be a vendor to support those. We're looking at beehives as the tool, as the way to get there. And so with blockchain, you know, we're thinking about, as you mentioned, a ledger. So over time, this is decentralized. It's not as though you or I or a central bank will have the records, but for our 1000 plus beehives, the best bees, each of them, all thousand, if they're connected to one another through the internet or an intranet, they each have the ledger. And so that the next day, they start a new ledger, they start a new um, block, so to speak, a new page. Yesterday's page is recorded and it cannot be manipulated because all thousand beehives have a copy of that. So you cannot hack this blockchain. It's a record of bee health. So no government or anybody else can say, oh, that beehive is doing great. Or they can say, oh, we're, our bees are healthy or our bees are dying. We know exactly what is going on with our food system. And that's where NASA comes in. The government really cares about food security. And so New England is one of our test markets where we've worked on this. If you look up New England food security and Best Bees and NOAA, you can look up a little bit about what we've been doing for this. We partnered up with their satellites and their earth observation unit to understand the impacts of climate on our pollinator health. And that tells us about our crops. But with blockchain, with that network of beehives, with the ledger that they're recording, over time, as they have more blocks and they're agreeing on how much honey is there and bee health, we're starting to see this natural record progressing and giving us some truth behind our data that cannot be hacked. Mm. It's an example of how companies can start to delve into this technology in a very low cost way that can engage people again through sharing honey and a little mm. QR code perhaps to show people what they're doing. That's fascinating. It's almost like it's creating a whole new market space. Yeah. And it's really all about inspiring our teams. You know, again, enthusiasm is what it all comes down to. And I'm sure that enthusiasm is what we're maybe lacking most in a world of Zoom all day long. Uh, yeah, it's exhausting, isn't it? It really is. You know, and maybe some of us want to get up and do a waggle dance. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I could I could get into that. It really <laughs> is. But, you know, it's all about thinking about things a little bit differently so that we surprise ourselves. Mm -hmm. and we start to feel that enthusiasm that we could have lost. And we all do this inevitably. Mm -hmm. But taking a different perspective on the same problem has so many benefits. And mm -hmm. that's where ICB is really coming in. Absolutely. So I'd love to spend just a couple of minutes on the company because I think it's fascinating. And we get, um, well, um, several dimensions. So one dimension is the whole notion of purpose. And certainly from younger people, we're hearing, you know, I want to be part of something bigger than me. I want to be part of something that has a purpose. I want to serve a mission. Um, and clearly best bees would be <laughs> tick, tick, tick on all those <laughs> things, right? But so you kind of go from this project, which was a web page to this company, which has been now recognized. It's having a huge impact, you know, in the world. Um, how did that happen? Like, how did you go from being somebody's crazy idea to being something that's real and making change happen in the world now? Rita, it's an amazing question. I think that it relates to so many companies and how they started as well. You know, I mentioned that we started the Best Bees Company with a Facebook page. Uh, when I say we, this was my best friend, um, Sean Cahill, I, as the story goes, um, approached him because he has some amazing software engineering skills. He had at the time kind of just an, an one man um, 
coding software company for small mom and pop businesses around Boston and Cape Cod, you know, a restaurant here, a bike shop there, creating their own operating systems. And I thought, I'm going to need that in order to scale, you know, for this business with installing and managing beehives and getting research data from them and sharing, giving all of the honey to the clients, I'm going to need a way to track this. So the first year I sold seven beehives. I was bartending, I was teaching, you know, I started an evolutionary biology class at Northeastern teaching microbiology at Tufts, you know, on the adjunct teaching circuit um, to pay the bills. And I thought if I can only sell 20 beehives, that'll be enough. Then I can have enough for research and I can live on that. Year two, we sold 12 beehives and the best bees company's model is with an annual recurring revenue. So our clients renew every year. So once a sale is made, it just builds the, the model. Our third year, we sold 65. And, and again, as the story goes with Cahill, he said, no, 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 go away, kid. I'm not doing that. And then uh, we went to a bar off campus at Tufts and I uh, gave him some whiskey and got him to sign a napkin. <laughs> That's my business card. <laughs> I said, we're doing this. And I would pay my friends with pizza and beer and soda to build our beehives. And I would store the bees in my apartment and my roommate. <laughs> How do you store bees in an apartment? I started this business out of my apartment. I mean, well, I mean how do you store, like, do, do they... Do you have to like open the window and let them go out during the day? A normal or? person question. I mean, I value I value you for helping to keep me grounded here. So they come in about a shoebox shape and sized package. It's called with one queen and about ten thousand bees inside. There a screen on the two largest size of the shoebox, and I would bring the packages around. I would bring them on the subway. I would bring them on buses. I didn't have a car. I would store them in my bedroom. Um, and my roommate one night called me crying as a, you know, an adult and said, I can't deal with this anymore. <laughs> I, I was like, what's the problem? <laughs> he, he and I are still very good friends. And uh, I was the best man at his wedding. He's wonderful. Her name's Ian. Uh, he showed me, hey, I'm in the business world as well. I know a warehouse in Boston that you can move this to. So can you please go? And over time now, that's our national headquarters. And we've built that out um, to have our you know, 70 employees in 15 cities. But it's grown organically without any investor funding mm -hmm. until today. So now we're 11 years in. Our beekeepers mostly work out of their homes and they go to their client sites. And we're one of those garage type companies that literally is bursting at the seams. Two years ago, our New York City beekeepers harvested a ton of honey and weight from their apartments alone. So we were bursting at the seams. I mean, they would put down a you know, food safe tarp and we had food safe equipment and we would sometimes rent out kitchens to harvest the honey. But I mean, we needed space. So um, right now we are having a very successful investor round. So any impact investors out there feel welcome to reach out to us if you'd like uh, to share the deck with you for your feedback, but it's going great. And this will allow us to have operations facilities in some of our key markets, um, including DC, um, Denver, San Francisco, and Seattle. Um, it's going amazing. and a uh, multi-million dollar company invented the industry um, and we're oh. the leader in it. We've had some other companies develop too. And it's been wonderful to see that scaling around the world. Uh -huh. So you must have gone from a stage where you had to start, you've gone through a stage where you had to start hiring people, right? Actual employees. Yes. Absolutely. Isn't that kind of nerve wracking when you're on a, on a bootstrap uh, journey? My advice for anybody starting a company from nothing is to get a therapist. <laughs> it's like the first employee you should have because it's so important. You know, I was teaching, you know, as you understand too, working with students, some schools out there, I learned, require their students to get an internship, but do not allow those students to be paid. Mm -hmm. And in seeking those schools out, my therapist showed me, I'm not allowed to feel guilty because they're getting credit from school. They're getting paid in some way. And so I, that's how I started it. I started with students. They would do research projects. Uh, I would facilitate their research and help them get published in, in any way I possibly could. And I've published with many students over the years, even my book with Princeton University Press. The, the, the co-author is one of my students, another book chapter coming out now. I love writing with students so much. Um, and that's how we got started. And then over time, we would create jobs from the best of the interns. And we created a professional development pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has grown over time. So our number three in the company, her name is Aaliyah Marinoni. So amazing, bright, brilliant. She started as an intern. And um, 
And it's been really rewarding. And it's been nice with the Global Good Fund to balance that younger feel out with some wonderfully older experienced people who can bring their knowledge to, to our organization. Mm -hmm. That's, that's brilliant. That's really interesting that, you know, how you kind of grew that organically. That's, that's a great story. So we're, we're, wow. Um, yikes. We're nearly out of time. My enthusiasm nearly carried me away here. <laughs> so if people um, want to learn more about you, I guess they can check out Best Bees, the site. You've got your TED Talks. What should people do to want to learn more about um, Noah's world? Rita, thank you for asking. So anybody interested in bees, beekeeping, getting bees of your own for your campus, uh, bestbees.com is a great place to go. In addition to looking for your local beekeepers association, if you want to learn how to become a beekeeper. Um, also, my personal website is noahwilsonrich.com um, for keynotes. So we can tailor these a lot for leadership lessons from the Beehive um, and looking at current white papers um, for any organizations that value the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as benchmarks. A new white paper came out that just lists how bees really help advance all of those. So there's so many ways that we can take inspiration and advancement, even with reporting support. Um, so reach out to noah at bestbees.com is my email. Um, Rita, I'm so grateful to you for this entire fireside chat. So oh, this has been fun. You know, I just, I can't get past this metaphor of like bees in a shoebox and now you're sending bees into space and you're working with NASA and you've got the United Nations. I mean, that's a pretty amazing arc <laughs> of a story. You know, and, and honestly, my vision is this gray to green movement. Mm -hmm. Think about all of the gray spaces in cities, understand that's not gonna stay that way. With a growing population and the land that is not growing, we're gonna to have to be smarter about it and we're going to have to focus on wellness more than ever in the future. So everybody, I want you to just think about where those gray spaces are in your life and think about what more you could do. Could you plant flowers, get a butterfly garden? Can you get a beehive? And can you connect those with data in any way to really drive impact? That is just wonderful. Well, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, I love to end these conversations with, you know, to be continued. So um, please get in touch with Noah, get a beehive, plant a flower. I love the idea of <laughs> gorilla seeds. That's amazing. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely weekend.